our necessary conversation. Welcome to everyone. I will paste a quick message in. Um, again, just welcoming you as you come on board. Um, we are so pleased to gather with everyone today, especially Michael Gelb, um, as our featured guest for this necessary conversation on um, the topic of uh, managing creativity to heal the world, learning from Leonardo da Vinci. I will introduce Michael Gelb shortly. Um, I want to add again our thanks to everyone joining. And again, many people will be joining us as the first minutes of this conversation unfold. Um, big thanks to the Donahue Center for Business Ethics and Social Responsibility at UMass Lowell for sponsoring this necessary conversation with Michael today. Um, this is an initiative, one of the many, of the International Humanistic Management Association. Um, we will make sure that we put a link to that website in the chat for your um, reference. Again, many other events coming up, um, and we encourage you all to, to join us, join our newsletter, join our efforts, join our energy. Um, thank you again for everyone who's joining. Michael, would you like to say a few things just quickly about the Humanistic Management Association? Well, uh, yes, as Erica said, <clears throat> we are bringing together people that are like-minded in the sense that we want to contribute to a better world through our teaching, research, and outreach. And uh, we define it through the notion of the protection of dignity, the intrinsic value of life, of nature and of humans, and also the promotion of flourishing as, as the ultimate goal, the promotion of well-being as the ultimate goal of our organizing efforts. And uh, that is very broad. And I think it is also sufficiently uh, different from what we're currently doing, the mainstream paradigm. So we have been focusing on building community intentionally and we're asking you all to invite if you feel that is resonating with you. And I wanna thank you, Erica and the Donahue Center for making this series possible. And I wanna thank Michael for being on and uh, being a kindred spirit. And, and sharing the gospel, so to speak. So thank you all. Great. Um, just briefly, a few more logistics as we get going. We are recording this conversation, so we will be muting everyone. And please do make sure uh, your microphone stays muted. Uh, we will also make the chat available and invite you to um, share any questions you have for Michael, comments, insights, um, resources, citations, so that this can really be a um, a real resource for this conversation moving forward as well. We will make the chat available too. Um, so without further ado, I think I would like to introduce Michael Gelb. Um, the introduction will be far too brief um, and we will also share Michael's website as well as uh, the most recent book that Michael has authored. Um, Michael joins us today as a leading authority on the application of genius thinking. Um, and it, in particular with regard to personal and organizational development. Um, he works with visionary leaders and organizations globally. He has co-directed the Leading Innovation Seminar at the Dar Darden Graduate, um, Graduate Program, and he teaches at the London Business School as well as um, at the Shiv Nadar University in India. So creativity and innovation are Michael's sweet spots, genius thinking. We can't wait to hear more about that. Welcome and big thanks, Michael. Um, I have a few questions to kick off, but perhaps you'd like to just say hello to everyone on the call. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. <laughs> great to be with you. Um, great. Again, welcome to all. Um, look for uh, prompts in the chat as that's helpful. Um, Michael, so you know a lot about healing organizations. You've given a lot of thought to this. What does it mean to be a healing organization? And again, I believe you have a book that's just come out recently on this topic. Wonderful. Let's see, it's called The Healing Organization. Awakening the conscience of business to help save the world. So healing means a return to wholeness. And clearly our world is fragmented. We have more divisiveness. We have a dissociation from the original noble purpose of capitalism. Adam Smith was a genius. 
He wrote The Wealth of Nations. It's a great idea. Freedom leads to prosperity. But he also wrote The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And that freedom and prosperity has to be grounded in fundamental goodness and inclusiveness and caring for all stakeholders. So this is actually the, the original idea. Smith wanted to uplift all of humanity, and he, had, he was especially concerned about people who we might call as uh, uh, disenfranchised. He wanted to enfranchise them with opportunity, with freedom. But that original vision has lost its way, and the healing organization is about how can we return to wholeness, and how can businesses, profit-oriented businesses, not just nonprofits and NGOs uh, and social entrepreneurs, but how can businesses, corporations, transform the way they think about what they do so that they focus their primary purpose on human well-being, on human flourishing, recognizing that abundance will flow from meeting human need, genuine human needs. And that's where creativity comes in. That, that does require you to think creatively, to innovate. So in the first part of the book, we do an overview of the history of capitalism, uh, and we even go long before that to the history of empire, because most of, of human history is, is humans lived in empires. And most people had no rights, uh, no opportunity to express their creativity. They were disenfranchised, and that was just the way it was. There were nobles, uh, uh, there was royalty, uh, there was a, a thin layer of wealthy, and everybody else was a serf or a slave. And that's how it's been for most of human history. So we're still, humanity still shifting to this idea that my guess is those of us on this call kind of just live and breathe that well human dignity uh, uh, human rights now, these are relatively new ideas in the evolution of human consciousness and even though they're infused into the notion of what business and capitalism is supposed to be about the dominant metaphors uh, that businesses still use unconsciously are, are metaphors of empire and war. And, and so part of, you know, how do we heal is we change the language, we change the metaphors, we change uh, the core way of, of conceiving what this enterprise is. Many good people, people who are well-intentioned. You know, most people don't go to business school and think, I want to open uh, 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 fake accounts to churn commissions uh, uh, for my bank. Uh, uh, they don't go to business school thinking, I want to jack up prices on uh, uh, needed pharmaceuticals to uh, uh, show Wall Street uh, what I can do at the expense of, of human well being. They don't really sign up uh, intentionally for evil, but they get co opted into it uh, because of this lack of awareness and consciousness. So it, it, it's, it's a it's a powerful journey that we, we, we went on ourselves to look at how we got this way and how we can change in the big picture. But the heart, the heart of the book and what was most moving to my co-author and myself, the actual stories of the people who are living this, who are doing this. And can you give us an example or two? Who, who are these healing organizations? Yeah. Who are these healing leaders? Just a couple of brief examples. Well, I'm going to give you three. Great. Because there's three types. Uh, there's three types of healing organizations that we generally found. And, the one, and there are many more than the ones we wrote about. Uh, but we wrote about the ones that we know. These, the ones that we wrote about are the ones where we visited them. We spent time with them. We spoke with the... CEO, uh, and, and they were the ones who also were most generous with us in terms of inviting us in. So the three types, uh, uh, those who started out as healing organizations, they started out with a conscious, conscious intention to help heal the world. Uh, the second type were those who 
started out with a, a general goodness, general, just generally good, caring, ethical people who wanted to infuse that in their business, but, but didn't really fully recognize the potential of their business to, to do healing first and making money second. And then the third type, which in a way is most interesting and most hopeful, are businesses that were really hurting organizations that were making the world worse to extract profit, who, uh, who went through an awakening of consciousness and transform. So in the first category, we tell the story of an amazing company called Life Guides, which was started with, with this phenomenal vision. You know when, uh, uh, if you have, a, 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 let's say you have kids who moved out of your house and you have a spare room, and Airbnb came along and said, oh, you can, you can provide lodging for somebody uh, uh, inexpensively and you can make some money. So all of a sudden there's a business based about the spare room in your house. Well, Life Guides is maybe you just spent 20 years caring for your parents who, who you watched them suffer from Alzheimer's and they passed away. And someone else just got a diagnosis that their, their parents uh, have Alzheimer's and they're facing 20 years of caregiving ahead. What if we could connect the person who just got that diagnosis with a trained guide who spent 20 years caring for their parents? Uh, so it's, the idea is to bring caring to a billion people within the next five years for life challenges, for the kinds of things that, that aren't really served in our world today. So that's the genius idea of Life Guides. And it's a functioning, uh, uh, viable uh, business, a, a, a marvelous uh, enterprise. Uh, uh, in the middle, uh, Hillman Consulting. Uh, I'm pointing over there because it's in New Jersey. They're a client of mine. I've been working with them. I know them really well because uh, uh, I was engaged by them four years ago. The proprietor, the, the founder, Chris Hillman, started his business when 30 something years ago, he was a young engineer on a project for a school in uh, uh, mid-Atlantic region. And he's doing an analysis of asbestos levels in the school and he finds dangerous levels of asbestos. That was his business, environmental engineering. So his uh, supervisor gave him an envelope with some cash in it and said, I need you to change your report. And Chris, who just, you know, actually raised, you know, a Catholic said, are you kidding me? I'm not going to do that. <laughs> uh, just your know, fundamental basic, whatever your tradition, every tradition teaches fundamental basic decency and goodness. Chris said, no way, I'm not going to do that. And he went on, started his own company. Uh, and he, he reported the asbestos anyway at grave risk to himself. So he started with this basic decency and goodness and built his company around that. But I've had the honor and privilege of working with, with Chris and his amazing team to, to consciously embrace this. And at one of our strategic planning meetings uh, uh, last year, Chris stood up and said, look, we've always intended to make a difference in our world, but I declare we're a healing organization. I declare that our first purpose is to heal the world and make it better. And from that, money and profit will flow and we'll share it abundantly, but that's why we're here. Uh, so that's the, the middle type. And the third type, it's, the story in the book is FIFCO, uh, which is a company based in Costa Rica that started out selling uh, uh, soft drinks and beer, which they still do. But uh, uh, the CEO who'd been recruited from uh, uh, one of the tobacco companies, so he went from facilitating the death of people to make money through tobacco to facilitating their death through sugar and alcohol until he finally woke up from all the conversations he'd had with regulators and activists over the years. And he finally just, they it got through to him. And he said, what if I view them as stakeholders instead of as the enemy? And he started to think, how can we lower sugar levels so that 
we're not promoting obesity. How can we promote the safe consumption of beer, one of their main products, so that we can lower uh, uh, drunken driving levels in our communities? And he did it dramatically. Then he responded to all the activists in the environmental impact space. Uh, and he said, we're going to make our environmental impact across all these dimensions zero by 2018, which they did. But then he went beyond that and he said, we need to be net positive contributors to the environment in all of these areas. So he said about uh, 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 making a goal for 10% net remediation, positive remediation of solid waste. Uh, of emissions and so on, which they're on that track to, to achieving. So this was this is uh, uh, Fifco Ramon Sanchez. Uh, uh, we, uh, I was co-chair of the Conscious Capitalism CEO Summit uh, last fall down in Austin, and Ramon came and spoke to us and talked about his journey with you know, hum humility, his awakening, and his transformation of this company. Now, what's happened to the profitability of Fifco? with this transformation. It's surge. It's how happy are people to work at this company? It's the best place to work in Costa Rica and one of the best places to work in the world. People come from all over to meet him. So three types of companies. Life Guide started with a vision to heal the world. Uh, uh, Chris Hillman started with, well, we're not gonna do harm and we're gonna do a decent business and have decent values and treat people well. And he's just continually raised the vibration and the, and the intensity of his focus on, on goodness uh, uh, for the world. And then FIFCO, absolute transformation from, hey, it's just business, uh, it's not personal, to, oh no, it is personal for everyone we touch. Let's make the world a better place. Great, thank you. Um, just as a follow on to that, and I also do want to acknowledge, and I, we didn't acknowledge this at the beginning, but. Um, this gathering is also really a holding space for healing of the world right now, right? In the current crisis we're all facing. Um, so we are holding space for that. And in light of that, Michael, can you tell us what enables leaders, what enables um, organizations to step into this role as healer? What are the ingredients? What are the stepping stones? Um, well, it's not linear. Uh, if it was, we could just write a program for it and send it out to everybody. We've tried to, it's, it happens in different ways. People wake up in different ways, but it's, it's about waking up and it's about recognizing, I, you know, there's a, there is a paradigm shift that takes place from us versus them, from extraction of planetary resources for our own short-term aggrandizement and that somehow that will work out, which is, it's just so obviously absurd if you shed any light on it, uh, uh, to a, a shift that we're connected. Uh, uh, we're, what we do, it matters how you make the money. And this is interesting is that, that uh, an evolved power from the pure empire and war paradigm. Uh, there's a, you know, the previous generation had an idea that's still uh, still dominant today. Uh, it's it's the idea of people call it giving back, and I personally don't like that term because what that suggests is you extracted, and now you have to make up for the damage you did by what by the way you operated by donating to a charity or a, a, a a university or a hospital or something. Uh, and now having said that, you know, we live next to the Rockefeller Preserve. Uh, Rockefellers did an awful lot for humanity and they also wounded a lot of people. Carnegie is buried right over there in the, in the Sleepy Hollow Cemetery. Uh, he didn't mean to do evil, but a lot of people were wounded. A lot of deaths were caused in Pittsburgh. Most male, twenty percent of male deaths uh, in Pittsburgh during the period that his steel factories ran took place in those factories. Uh, so, and the whole uh, 
war between labor and management uh, uh, was part of the inheritance we all got from the way those captains and titans of industry did business. But then they tried to make up for it by starting foundations and giving it away. Carnegie said, in the first third of your life, get as much education as you can. In the next third of your life, make as much money as you can. And in the last third of your life, give away as much as you can. But now we don't have the luxury of you going through the 30 years of your life where you're ex extracting and, and, and making the world worse because the world may not be functioning by the time you come around to give it away. So even you know, Bill Gates, uh, Warren Buffett, who started the Giving Pledge, uh, and it's amazing, there's now 204 billionaire families have committed to give half their wealth to uh, make the world a better place, to heal our, our suffering. But it's, it matters how you make the money. So we say uh, the, heal, the, the giving pledge needs the healing oath. Uh, at the end of the book, uh, we, we, we invite people to take a healing oath. First, do no harm. Primum non nocere. Uh, uh, malus eradicare. Uh, 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 which is to eradicate evil, to root out evil, uh, don't collude with evil, amor vincit omnia, operate from love, love conquers all, right? So it, it, it's, it's, so we, we're trying to invite people to have a, a, a conscious affirmation uh, to lead their business in a healing way, and then to give them support and skills and practices of best practices of healing organizations. And for this, this is a, it's a noble vision. The good news is my co-author, Professor Raj Sasodi, has done a lot of the, you know, he's a business school professor at Babson. He's done a lot of the research on how, when you do care for all your stakeholders, including the community and planet, you'll be more profitable. So. You know, read that, read, read his book, Firms of Endearment. Once you know that, why would you do anything else? People just don't, you know, they haven't gotten the good news we were, we were uh, uh, hearkening to earlier. This is truly good news, and it's amazingly inspiring. And this was urgent before we were going through this crisis. Now, these are the times that, that, that test the souls of leaders. They test people, say you have values, you say you have goodness, you say you have a higher intention. But, you know, people in these positions are being, being tested and we want to do our best to, to, to support them and, and, and help them care for their stakeholders in, in this very, very challenging time. Great, thank you. So I want to connect these ideas to creativity and genius thinking. Um, so most people would say they're not creative. How would you respond? And how would you respond as far as connecting the potential we have as leaders and organizations to achieve healing? How do we bridge that with creativity? Sure. Well, first let's start with the notion that some people think that they're not creative. And I, when I do seminars, I have people fill out a little questionnaire or respond to just a poll about how creative they think they are. And over the years, I've worked with lots of engineers and, and uh, analysts and people who don't think of themselves as creative at all. But I've also worked with artists and people who think of themselves as wildly creative. So I'm familiar with the whole uh, uh, spectrum and a lot of times the challenge with the people who think of themselves as not creative is to get them to change their self-concept of what's possible and the challenge with the people who think they're wildly creative is to get them more organized and focused <laughs> uh, but the uh, let's deal with your question about people who think they're not creative uh, there's a lot of research on this at Stanford the Torrance tests uh, uh, turns out that you can raise your score on a creativity test immediately by 25% if you pretend you're creative. So you don't have to believe that you are, just learn to act as if you were. 
uh, and then you will be. So it, it's a significant, there's about 25% difference you'll get in terms of your idea generation. And it's not mystical or magical, it just makes sense. If you pretend you're creative or imagine you are creative or ask what would a creative person do? I have people ask what would Leonardo da Vinci do in this situation? How would he think? It doesn't have to be you, maybe you're not creative, but Leonardo's creative, how would he think? Uh, and then we give people tools for doing that and all of a sudden they, they generate all kinds of creative ideas. So the real question isn't how creative do you think you are? The real question is, is creativity a skill that can be developed? And I've just devoted the last 40 years uh, based on my obvious answer to that question, which is, yeah. <laughs> so how can we develop it? How can we develop our creativity as we, you know, try to transform and heal the world. Sure, well, just like whatever skill you wanna develop, it really helps to have a role model. Uh, so if you wanna develop creativity, start with the most creative person who ever lived. For me, that's Leonardo da Vinci. He was my childhood hero. I, I went through his notebooks and with one question in mind, and the question was, what's he trying to teach us? Because what's wonderful about Leonardo is he actually gives specific advice to his students on how to develop creative thinking. Uh, and so I, abstract, I abstracted what he said and I identified seven principles for thinking like Leonardo da Vinci. And the first one is one that you're already embodying by asking me these marvelous questions. And that is curiosita, curiosita, unrelenting, creativity, which if uh, uh, curiosity, which if you think about it, is our birthright. Who are the most curious people? Children. Who has the wildest imagination? Children. Who has the most energy? Also children. So if you want a renaissance of your personal energy, wake up your curiosity, wake up your imagination. So we guide people through uh, processes to help them go deep into what are the core questions of their lives uh, and 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 keep a little notebook with you and, and and write your reflections so that's the first principle for thinking like leonardo and there's six more so um since you do have experience both in business practice and in the world of management um scholarship how can how can we as sort as come together how can we as business trainers how can we as management faculty um help nurture creativity toward this healing goal yes. nurture your own creativity first be be experience in yourself a renaissance of your own creative power and potentiality you know so my, michael professor pearson and i we co-led a, a, a seminar, Master's of Management seminar uh, last week for, for some of the students at, at the Gabelli School. And we did it, at, we did it on Zoom, uh, just like we're having this meeting. And what's great is uh, we had a follow-up call and Michael showed me all the mind maps he had all over and <laughs> hung up on his ceiling because he took to heart everything we were doing and you can feel his own curiosita which is pretty powerful just on any given day but he was asking how can i take it to another level so wherever we are uh, it's it's to ask how can we go deeper how can we embody what we want to teach because the only problem with the the uh, my clients in business for many years said they use the word academic as a synonym for irrelevant. People say, oh, that's an academic issue, which means go blather about it while we figure out how to really get something done. But what we're about, obviously, is the, the flow between research, between the academy. And let's go back to the real meaning of the academy and the renaissance of the true meaning of the academy, because this was Plato's uh, uh, formulation for the development of the soul focus on philosophy the love of wisdom focus on 
what is truth, what is, what, is, what is true, what is beautiful, what is good? How do they relate to one another? And then if we're a business school or business educators, how do we bring T, B, and G into business? Truth, beauty, goodness. So, you know, I was a psychology and philosophy major. I never thought about uh, uh, having anything to do with business. When I was growing up, business was the evil empire, it was the military industrial complex. I, I just, the last thing I thought I'd be doing. And in 1982, I moved to Washington, D.C. because I thought it was the place in the world where creativity and innovation were most needed. And I thought I could make a difference by helping uh, to get through to politicians. Well, you can see how well that turned out. <laughs> but the good news is I met the people who were most interested in, in what I was researching were business people. And I was blessed that the ones who engaged me were ones who had this kind of vision that use their, their power as an organization to make people's lives better. So I learned from my clients over the years. I really was clueless about business when I started, but these were ethical, caring, visionary people. And I knew how to think creatively and how to teach that. I knew how to help people improve your memory, uh, read faster, uh, uh, learn, accelerate learning. That was all of my study and, and passion. And, and, and so they engaged me and I watched them use what I was teaching to, to fulfill higher visions of what business could be. And I started to pay attention and learn from my clients. And so that's what led to, uh, to where we are now. Great. I have just one more question and then we're gonna dive into the chat and invite people to um, ask you their questions. But right now, right in this moment, how can healing leaders, healing organizations, or organizations or leaders who aspire to be healers, how can they harness the power of creativity to make the difference we need in the world right now in light of this disruption and pandemic? Well, it's to figure out what's, what's your circle of influence. What's your circle of influence? You all have, you know, the danger for all of us is we are swallowed up by our circle of concern. It's, and and it's, it's horrifying on so many levels. I mean, I have to limit my, so I am on a social media fast uh, uh, because there's only so much of this you can take in and not feel disempowered. Uh, so that's one thing is create the boundaries uh, uh, for yourself and figure out what's your, what's your circle of influence. Where can I act today? How can I help make someone else's life more beautiful? Uh, if I'm running a business, I ask today, I go to every person in my organization and I say, how can I support you? What do you need to do your job? Uh, how can we, and I'm literally, this is what we do. This is what we have our managers do just in so-called normal times. Uh, and you know, one of the companies we profiled in the book uh, uh, was a call center. Remember those? And, and the turnover in their company was 120%, which was better than the industry average of 150%. And this is one of the stories of a CEO who had an awakening of conscience. And he, he just was, he said, I felt a deep sense of shame, but he, he transmuted it into caring. And he, he came up with this question, how can we help you? What can we do? And at first people didn't want to say anything because they didn't believe him. But he, he persevered and with the simplest thing, people in a call center said, well, you know what? You could get us new chairs because we all have a terrible back ache. And it's hard to be nice to customers on the phone when we're in pain. They got them new chairs by the end of the week. Turnover in that company went down uh, to 18%. What happened to the profitability of that company? Dramatic, right? So, in your that was something in his sphere of influence that he could do so this is where creativity you know remember i said think of lots of ideas if you were creative what would you think of so in my circle of influence how can i uplift people today how can i empower people today how can i share goodness truth and beauty today uh, uh, what i mean and literally with you know in your network of friends share hopeful messages share something funny i'm sending poems to people i'm sending yes i'm, I'm sending jokes to people 
because the ha ha and the aha ha go together. Uh, you know th what we're going through is so serious. If you're not gonna, if you don't laugh, you're not gonna make it. Uh, 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 right? Your, your immune system needs the laughter, uh, uh, and then you can open your mind. But then it's also what's in my circle of influence. When we act in our circle of influence, our circle of influence expands. If we just, you know, and you know, I can feel this community. There's such caring people. We all have to support each other in not being overwhelmed by by the the misery and the suffering uh, that's in the circle of concern. So acknowledge the circle of concern. Don't ignore it. Be sober. Be real, and let it. Whoosh, empower that fire within you to be a healer, to make a difference, and then be open. May, you don't may not, you know, the answer for each person here may be something that will arise for you as you hold this question. This is the power of curiosita. Hold this question: How am I to serve in this time? And then have your notebook with you. And when you get, we wake up at four o'clock in the morning. With, with a little, with a notion or idea, write it down, journal about this. How can I be of, of, of service? Uh, and, 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 and pray. I mean, for those who, who, who pray in whatever context, I mean, we, we bought this house. Uh, we moved here three years ago and we love the energy and the feeling of the house. What we didn't know was that in the bushes behind our house, is a statue of St. Francis blessing the house. Now, the prayer of St. Francis just happens to be one that lives within me and has done for many, many years as a nice Jewish boy from New Jersey. <laughs> because I'm, I'm not, for me, this is universal teaching. For me, this is, this is not Catholic, it's not Jewish, it's not Muslim. It's not Buddhist, it's not Hindu, uh, it's not anything separate. It's only oneness. It's only, it, it, it has to be. If there's, if there's truth, Great. Thank you. something that unites all of us. So I, I see a question um, from Velvetina. If you're there, feel free to unmute yourself and ask, but this is about uh, that play between being creative and being deviant. And you what's know, the I, trigger? I I saw What's that. the trigger to activating healing? Yeah. Um, Velvetina, are you there? Do you want to yeah. expand on that? or? Yeah, so um, part of my own research is very interested in this interplay about how you know, individual creativity activates um, being very helpful towards others in terms of pro-sociality and also at the same time being deviant. So I'm just curious to see like how people tread the fine lines if you know, we're constantly trying to be creative. What triggers us in the environment? Was it just something innate between us, like the willingness to be good, for example, that keeps us on the good side? Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, love it, love it, love it. So uh, deviants may save the world. <laughs> we'd, be, we'd be really in trouble without the so-called deviants. And, uh, I don't remember the source where I got this, but I'm sure you can find it. Uh, uh, ants, 97% of ants go in a straight line between where they are and where the next source of uh, nutrient happens to be. 3% of ants just wander around and they sort of stay with the group, but they're deviants. 3% of ants are just deviant ants and they're just off like, you know, doing wacky, creative ant stuff. They're not just marching along with all the other ants. And when a giant tree falls down or a boulder you know, smashes a, a, a huge amount of, of the ant population, the deviants are the ones who go around it and reformulate everything and keep the, the whole group alive. So it's, it's our artists and our musicians it's, it's why the arts become even more important in these times but my mission has always been well the way I, one way i say it is you know, we think of uh, 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 people always ask me too about the, the fine line between so-called madness and genius and what i what i my 
the response that came to me on this is uh, uh, geniuses and people we call mad are out in the midst of, of the ocean. Geniuses are the ones who somehow manage to, to swim. And, and, and the ones we call mad are drowning. Most of us are safely on the shore. So learning to start to think more creatively is getting your feet wet. Uh, it's do a little uh, uh, doggy paddle, uh, uh, go out into the surf and play. Uh, uh, so that for many people who are not used to learning about uh, creative thinking and the methodologies of creative thinking, it, it's, it's, it's modeling what geniuses do. And I'll tell you one thing, they, one thing they do, we've already covered, they all keep notebooks and they write things down in non-linear fashion. So they write what occurs to them when it occurs to them without editing. They do lots of creative doodling and daydreaming, all the things most of us were told not to do in elementary school. They do lots of creative doodling, lots of daydreaming. They jot down their thoughts and they, they dream. They dream and they, they generate lots of ideas. They go for sheer quantity of ideas first, then they organize them. The simplest secret of liberating your creativity is to generate first, then organize. Most people suffer from premature organization. They're afraid of getting the wrong answer, the wrong idea. So, so they stay locked into an outline and they're looking for the right answer first. But a principle of genius thinking is just get lots of ideas. Don't prematurely organize them or analyze them. Then sleep on it. And then see what you've got. And then ask incisive questions. And then you go back. This is the yin and yang. This is the pulsation. The convergent thinking. Divergent thinking. So I made up a, a term for this in 1996. I coined the term synvergent thinking, the synergy between convergent and divergent thinking, which is like breathing, which is like the pulsation of life. A healthy pulsation has expansion and compression, right? So we learn, we learn to do that with our thinking. We learn to expand it out farther than we're comfortable with. And then we focus it in and then we expand it out again. Thank you. So there was a question earlier that came through privately. It's one of the first chat questions that came through. So I want to make sure Tanya has a chance to ask her question because I think there's more to it than she wrote, but it was about bringing out the best and worst from people um, this particular time in our shared history, our shared humanity. And inspired by Leonardo, how can we deal with such contrast? But Tanya, if you have more to add, please jump on. Um, thank you for that question. Okay, it's okay for me, Erica, please. Okay, great. So, please. All right, so just say the essence of it again, please. So, so Tanya is noting that this particular time um, brings out the very best and also the very worst yes. in people. So that idea of dichotomy that you were just talking about. So inspired by Leonardo, inspired by genius thinking, how can we as healers uh, address those types of contrasts? Well, well, you know, before this crisis, the, the Healing Organization book came out in uh, September and we, we had to quote, it's the best of times and the worst of times and now it's even more so. I mean, this all, that's actually always true and it always is more intense, and now it's even more intense. So it's why, you know, it's why something we have validated through research is that emotions are contagious, for better or for worse. So now is the time to be careful what you catch and spread, not just in terms of dis-ease. You know, every time you wash your hands and, and do something self-protective, you're also protecting others. Do it with a spirit of blessing and gratitude rather than a spirit of fear and contraction. Uh, you know, we all have, I don't, whatever our most noble uh, uh, intentions, we all have a reptilian brain and a mammalian brain. 
it's hard not to be frightened. So how do you not share fear and exacerbate fear, which you can see many people doing, making it worse? Uh, uh, you have to have courage. This is a time for courage. Courage is a quality of the heart, right? Core means heart, right? So we have to we have to have the heart to choose whenever we can to consciously spread hope and kindness and love and generosity, even when we might be feeling fearful ourselves. So that's the time to, to rally within yourself. And look, Leonardo, the Renaissance would not have happened without the Black Plague. It's way worse than, way worse than uh, a Corona, I'm telling you. Uh, between 75 and 200 million people died and they died really quickly and very visibly. And it was horrifying beyond anything we can even really imagine. You know, even the Spanish flu of, of, of 1918, far worse, far unimaginably worse, was much less, you know, you couldn't have a Zoom, you couldn't call somebody, you couldn't get information. It, it just horrifying just what previous generations of humanity had to go through. But out of, out of the Black Death, the Renaissance arose. Leonardo, Leonardo was in Milan while there was a plague going on. He designed city plans to be to have greater sanitation and believe it or not, social distancing. This is before germ theory. You can, you can, uh, uh, I put, there's a thing I put on a medium about Leonardo's advice for dealing with Corona. Check it out. You can see his image of the, uh, uh, the city plan that he set up. And he said, learn to preserve your own health. Be responsible for your own health and wellness. He said, avoid grievous moods and keep your mind cheerful. That's 500 years ago before psychoneuroimmunology told us that our attitude affects our immune system moment to moment. So now is the time we live, we know we're called all, all called to live our values. Doesn't mean we're not going to feel terrified. Doesn't mean we're not going to feel uh, like we're not up to it. Uh, if you don't have those moments, you know, you're probably on some other planet than I am because I have them. Uh, I, I, it's humbling. Uh, but then we rise up uh, uh, from that and we take responsibility for being instruments of peace and love and joy and caring. So I see there's this wonderful, rich conversation going on about truth, beauty, and goodness. And I, I hope we can shift back to that. But, you know, what an interesting topic that would be, right? TBG and uh, the time of Corona. But um, I also want to invite Sandra Waddock, who asked one of the first questions, too, about mindsets and shifting mindsets. She, Sandra, would you like to come on? Yeah, I'm on. Great. I think I'm on. Hi, Michael. Thank you. Um, I've admired the work that you and Raj are doing um, for years here. Um, so you talked early on, and maybe this question isn't so relevant anymore, but you talked early on about um, some of the companies that went through uh, major mind what looked like major mindset shifts and of course we know that companies have been operating under the story for many years of um that their purpose is to maximize shareholder wealth and you and raj among others have been kind of fighting that story but what what kind of things shape reshape mindsets what are the processes that people have gone through or the traumas maybe maybe i'm sure that this coronavirus thing will shape reshape some mindsets not some probably not some others but um but what are, what, what have you learned about that thank you yes uh thank you uh, i'm still i'm still learning i i can't say that i have the, again that there's a formula for for how it happens uh, i do agree with you that this is a an op opportunity to sh to transform mindset in a on a global scale if you are living under the illusion that allows you to uh, ex just extract without sense of con uh, consequences if you are living under the illusion that you are separate that your organization is separate that your country is separate that your tribe is somehow separate from the whole of humanity that, that illusion 
if you're if you're paying attention, which not everybody is. So, it, it, uh, you know, it's how many how many uh, uh, geniuses and and transformational leaders does it take to change a light bulb? Only one, but the light bulb has to want to change on some level. Uh, uh, but here, you know, we're getting a planetary wake-up call that says, uh, "Excuse me, you're all connected. Uh, uh, this phenomenon crosses your artificial, absurd boundaries. Wake up. There's one planet. We all breathe the same air." Thanks. Um, so I do, I, and we're running a little bit short on time, so we'll not get to every question in the chat, but know that we will um, make this chat available. And I believe Michael's available to continue um, chatting about this by email. Um, and we can certainly convene more platforms around this through uh, the Humanistic Management Association. Um, but I do see two questions I want to just quickly touch on. One is, I think it's Denise or Dennis Kayan about um, how can good businesses or businesses for good profit. And then I want to get also to the question that came from Nikita. But Denise, are you there? Am I saying your yep, name? I am. Yeah, Denise. <laughs> good. Um, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to know, like, what is the difference between these businesses for good and like how they start their business versus the, like just conventional businesses and you know, what is the difference in profit that they make, like, I guess, in the early stages? Because, like you said, um, you know, businesses for good can still make profit. I just wanted to know, like, what was the difference between the two? Yes, well, uh, my co author wrote a book called Firms of Endearment, which was one of the first books to do the research from a like a business school case study analyzing profitability uh, uh, in the framework of companies that put human values first. And what's fascinating is in a later book uh, called Conscious Capitalism and his other uh, uh, research, he's followed up a long-term study between the firms of endearment and the companies profiled in Good to Great. Uh, which is you know, one of the biggest business bestsellers and is still taught in a lot of business schools to this day. But Good to Great focuses only on financial return. So we, we actually covered this in the healing organization. Uh, uh, the firms of endearment outperform the Good to Great companies purely on the criteria of, of greatness set forth by the Good to Great companies, which is money. So the firms of endearment outperform the good to great companies. So that, uh, that's a great place to start, is to look at, read firms of endearment uh, uh, and compare the results of those companies with the companies profiled in, in Jim Collins's book. Uh, we summarize it for you in, in the healing organization, but if you want to go back and get the details, that's where they reside. Nikita, are you there? I thought your question was a, a nice one for beginning to wrap up about how academia um, can facilitate this shift in, an, in our more conventional approach to education. Are you there, Nikita? Good afternoon. Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Thank you so much. This is such an interesting and um, critical conversation right now. And um, recently, um, the UN published the Sustainable Development and Human Wellbeing report um, discussing different countries in the world and uh, their level of happiness. And I've been taking a look of, about um, the different concepts covered in that. And um, what you really, what you just said, really hit hit everything on the head for me because um, curiosity, imagination, and energy are so critical to innovation and um, I've been really thinking of uh, the current system of education and how it sort of hinders creativity and um, curiosity and at the same time 
how education is such how edu excuse me sorry how education is such a a critical factor in enabling human well-being and how um, innovation was also one of the critical factors recognized by the UN as enabling human well-being and um, Finland, for example, and Denmark were at the top of the list for countries who scored the highest in um, world happiness, um, national happiness, and um, the level of innovation and the uh, type of education that they have in their countries uh, really contributed significantly to that. And so it, it comes back again to enabling imagination, enabling cu cu curiosity, and creativity in schools. And I'm just wondering, as a PhD student at the moment, how can I use my research to really contribute in a way that can create a shift that is significant in terms of creativity and innovation and enabling countries to more countries in the world to realize the kind of happiness and well-being that um, that Finland and Denmark and um, Switzerland and all the other countries would really top the charts on that. If, if my research can really facilitate that shift globally, I would be, um, I would really feel that I, I am using my, my, um, my research and my time to make a meaningful contribution and really live in a life with purpose. And so, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. So this is my mission uh, to help bring forth a world that's more creative, more compassionate, more conscious. And creativity, learning how to think creatively, it's always been my wish to have this be part of the curriculum. Uh, uh, for me, I, my, part of my fulfillment of the work on how to think like Leonardo da Vinci is that the seven <laughs> principles, they have been adopted by schools around, around the world uh, uh, as a basis for a curriculum that teaches the fulfillment of human potential, happiness, and creative thinking. So it's not just a STEM science, technology, engineering, and math. It's STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And Leonardo is the supreme role model for the integration of that art and science, which is the original vision of what a liberal arts education is supposed to be, uh, is, is the integration of the, the humanities and the sciences. They're not supposed to be separate. It's all supposed to be integrated. So Leonardo, to me, the seven principles for thinking like Leonardo uh, are, are potentially a curriculum uh, that's been used in scattershot way all around the world. And I'm in the process now of focusing this more. We're aiming first, we're creating a, a, a video program that we're gonna release globally to educate uh, uh, people at the business school level and people who actually work in organizations on applying the seven principles beyond just the book. It's an online video seminar, which we'll be launching this summer. Uh, but what we want to do next is the online video training on Da Vinci's principles in the classroom. So I invite you, write me an email uh, uh, after this session, and let's stay in touch about how we might be able to include you in, in some of our curriculum development uh, for that, because we, we, we definitely will need, need help and support and it, it'd be a fun opportunity for lots and lots of uh, research and contribution. Thanks, Michael. Michael, what is your email? I'll put it in the chat right now. Sure, it's uh, uh, michael at michaelgelb.com. michaelgelb.com, got it. Uh, whoops, it's Michael A.E. Sorry, everybody. Great. Michael. Um, I think this is it. It should work for everyone. We are just about at our limit. So I think at this point, we will wrap up. Huge thank you, Michael, for joining us today for your insights on creativity and healing, um, inspiring us at an important moment for inspiration <laughs> and transformation. Um, Again, many thanks to everyone who joined from around the world. We have many other events coming up through the International Humanistic Management Association. We'll have more necessary conversations sponsored by the Donahue Center for Business Ethics and Social Responsibility at UMass Lowell. 
Um, feel free to send any of us questions, comments. At any point, we will make the recording available. We will make the chat available. Thank you all. Be well wherever you are. Thank you.